Welcome to the very first Location Tech NZ event. I'm really proud to have you guys here. Um, my name's Sam, and I'm the chair of the Establishment Council. And um, tonight, we've asked you along um, for a purpose. We want to invite you to join us in empowering innovation using location-based technology. Now, before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. So um, the toilets are out through that door and across from the stairs, and the exits are the green exit sign above the door, not the red no exit sign, um, unless you're a fan of jumping. So I'm going to be bold and assume that my PowerPoint's going to go up. There we go. And that my green button's going to work. Or not. Or not. Oh, there we go. Cool. Sweet. So I'm going to be bold and assume that you're here tonight because there's something about location technology that's important to you. Whether it's your business, your job, your study, you recognise that location technology is foundational to New Zealand's digital landscape and ultimately to New Zealand's ability to prosper, however you choose to measure that. We're here to build on an existing capability, a capability that you've likely contributed to. I want to quickly share about where we think we're going, and then we're going to come back and, um, to where we are now, and I'm going to ask you to do something. Realise that this isn't set in stone. Um, we really need you. We need our New Zealand community to help us shape the direction and our tactics. But this is where we're starting, and I'd um, love to share it with you. I'd really love to. There we go. Um, so Location Tech is a part of the wider NZ Tech Alliance. And as such, we're working, um, they've created a really good foundational, uh, some foundational uh, structures that we're relying on in terms of our strategy. And I wanted to talk you through some of that. So typically, um, and I think Graham's going to talk about this a little bit um, afterwards, uh, this follows along the lines of connect, promote, and advance. But I'm going to flip that on its head, and we're going to start by looking at where we're going to go, which is around the advanced um, Around the advanced pillar first. Here we go. So advanced is really looking at how we take the location technology sector and we grow and export it. We're looking at skills and capabilities to ensure that graduates have the skills that they need um, to be effective as employees and contribute when, when, and, and fill the needs that, that business wants to employ them for. And it's about helping government understand the value of location technology better. And I, I don't mean to that flippantly because I know that some of you guys represent government agencies and are very well aware of location technology's value. It's about sending that message louder. Mm. So this is about what we need to do in order to grow the sector. Um, we've had a few uh, things that have come up in the past, in our past life as CBA, around uh, getting geospatial on the New Zealand skills shortage list. Um, and there's ongoing discussions to be had around foundational data sets and the sorts of capabilities that, that um, New Zealand, the New Zealand industry needs to grow and thrive. Now let's look at connecting. So connecting is about how do we connect up the location technology ecosystem and, and connect it to other ecosystems. So we're gonna be running events, but it's gonna be networking with a purpose. It's gonna be around those purposes that we looked at um, around the advance of, of, of location tech. It's about connecting the New Zealand ecosystem more. This isn't just about geo, geospatial consultants or, or people that use a particular type of technology. It's not about GIS. This is about the wider New Zealand fabric of people that are using um, location to innovate and to benefit across a wide a range of horizontal and vertical sectors. And we're going to learn about that tonight from Matt Leith, who's going to be sharing, and also um, from an interview that we did with Mark Rocket a few days ago. 
It's about making international connections. If you guys are aware of international groups, like standards groups, conferences, things that we should be plugging into, lessons that should be learned, we want to be building into that. We want to be making those connections and we want to build credibility so that as we move into the future, when we start looking about how we, we advance, how we advance location technology, how we advance digital in New Zealand, we have the credibility to grow. We want you guys to join Location Tech, and we want you guys to think of it like a gym membership. The more you get involved, the more you use it, the more value you're going to get from it, and the better we're going to thrive as New Zealand. And finally, one of the ways we're going to do this is around promoting. We're going to promote the importance of location technology to New Zealand and New Zealand technology to the world. We're going to do this through traditional forms of communication like newsletters and case studies, but we're also going to employ social media. We're going to build tech stories. We're going to showcase. We want to hear what you guys are doing. We want to hear what the industry is doing, and we want to sing it loud and clear so that people are aware of what's happening in our, in our country. And one of the things that I really think is great about New Zealand is that we're so conducive to building this. We're a small country. We can be quick. We're nimble and, at, and, and agile. Our size is, our, is on our side. I mean, there's only two degrees of separation. So really, by meeting with events like this, we have the ability to change things. We're going to look for opportunities to participate in government engagement, leveraging the experience of both CBA, which is where we've come from, and NZ Tech, which is where we're going. So I'd like to welcome you guys to come along, and I'd like to introduce Graham Mueller from uh, NZ Tech to share a bit about uh, what's happening at a slightly higher level. Thank you, Sam. Well, firstly, hi, I'm Graham from NZ Tech. Uh, I am the chief executive of NZ Tech. Um, firstly, I just want to say on behalf of NZ Tech and the Tech Alliance, it's fantastic that we've got here today. We've been working with CBA for probably four years on an on a evolution in terms of initially trying to help CBA achieve some of the things that it was doing over the previous years, which are in line with our strategy, which I'll talk to you about in a second. And, and as we've gone through that uh, evolution, it became more and more apparent that being part of the embedded community is going to have so much more legs for you and, and, and us together to really make a change. Uh, so NZ Tech, for those of you who haven't met us or don't know us, is a not-for-profit NGO. Uh, it was founded 12 years ago to be the voice of the tech sector as an umbrella group. And uh, the interesting story was government did a research paper, found 66 tech associations trying to talk to the government. And so Stephen Joyce at the time went, all right, tech sector, you've got to get yourself sorted. We need an umbrella group. So uh, big firms, Microsoft, IBM, Telecom at the time, Vodafone, Datacom, these guys all got together, the CEOs went, right, we've got to do this. Um, and they fortunately designed it really, really nicely, got some consultants in, got it designed very uh, well-structured, good constitution, good purpose and vision and things like that. And then went around to all these other associations like CBA and, and, and many others and went, right, we're here with the umbrella. And they all went, piss off go away, we don't want to be umbrellaed, doing quite well. It took a few years for that organisation to mature and decide that actually it had a strong purpose, lived by the purpose, which is what we do is uh, we're a not-for-profit funded by members who are there to help create a more prosperous New Zealand underpinned by technology. And so when we made that pivot moment six years ago, and went, we don't have to own the members, we have to live to our purpose. And so we started to go to associations, we created the Tech Alliance as a neutral place to work together, and we started to go to associations and start helping them, which is great because uh, most associations are voluntary run, like CEPA, uh, have limited membership resources, and Z Tech has uh, quite a few members, and so we were able to use some of our resources to help, and some of our thinking, and what became very clear was almost every other association, its, it's main focus of the, of the board and the members is to get stuff done. It's not on running an association. And so we'd mastered the art of running an association, had best practice, stand, lots of things, and uh, standardized practices and systems and staff. Uh, and so we've been able to share that. And then eventually what happens, what has happened in the last three years, is that 16 organizations that are independent, like CBA, disestablished themselves over time in those three years and reformed within NZ Tech. Our constitution allows them to all operate independently with their own board and their own members. But what happens now is that you now are an organization that is in a community of 20 associations, which have 1,500 members, which employ more than 10% of New Zealand's workforce. 
Uh, we have 38 staff, we have five officers, we've got government relations, media relations, um, event teams, etc., etc. We ran 220 member events last year, we ran six conferences, took six delegations before COVID. Uh, we run Tech Week, which runs 500 events in a week. We run the New Zealand Tech Story, which advertises New Zealand overseas as a tech nation, et cetera, et cetera. So what you have is credibility. And what we need to do together is build the location tech brand in this community, have its own credibility under that own brand, which really then reinforces the Tech Alliance and, and, and others. It's an it's a additive thing. The better Agritech goes or the better AI Forum goes or Digital Identity goes or NZ Tech goes, the better you benefit from it. And likewise, the better we can help you be successful, the strength and grow in your numbers, uh, the strength in the, in the message you're taking to government or to the market or internationally, it's all additive. So it's great. So you've got the, all the support and backing. I just thought I'd take a moment. Um, uh, Sam just kind of mentioned the framework. So you, you'll, you'll see that we've got these structures like strategic planning and financial controls and all this, which enable most of the time for this organization now to be spent on what it's trying to do. And that's very clear. We went through that this morning session. We know there's big things we want to change. And so we're well on the way to getting it done now. Um, I, I thought I'd just come in at the top and talk about some of the stuff that NZ Tech's doing across all of New Zealand International, just to give you a sense of things that you can now plug into and go, what's the, what's the location tech lens on that? Um, probably the biggest thing that's happening at the moment is industry policy from this government is around our economic development growth policy is around industry policy. So they've made a change uh, last term that went, we're going to grow our economy with industry focus. And then during COVID, they made digital technology their number one industry focus. So there's five sector policy things going on at the moment. Three of them are around um, volume and trying to fix those industries, uh, which is around food and beverage, manufacturing and forestry. And there's two that they're focusing at the, the top pinnacle ones, which are agri-tech and, and digital tech. Uh, NZ Tech's running both of those. So one of the philosophies for the government was that they would be industry-led. So uh, we partner with MB, um, MPI, NZTE, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole, a whole lot of work streams around those and a whole lot of opportunities. Uh, that gives a framework which allows us to actually um, aggregate government and industry thinking towards the stuff that's going to make the biggest difference. And why that's interesting with um, uh, for location tech is if I tell you about, for example, the work streams that have been developed into the digital tech, you'll start to go, oh, there's a location angle there, location angle there. So just in the digital tech one, um, after a whole lot of consultations around the country at the end of last year, start of this year, came up with five work streams, um, three that are about growing the digital tech sector. One is about um, artificial intelligence, and, and, and just to be clear, these are industry transformation strategies to 2050. So what's the vision of we want the tech sector to be in 2050? Hard to pick, right? But, but one of the big transformational areas is artificial intelligence. Another one is the role of Māori and Pacifica in the, in the, in, in the digital space, and another one is um, getting our exports actually cranked up at, at a lot faster and a lot harder. So those are the big things. And then under that, there's um, foundations, skills and talent development, uh, data, uh, government um, procurement and spending and how the government uses its money around the space and capital. And then wrapped right around that is telling the tech story. And so uh, Agritech has got the same thing. It's got a bunch of work streams. It's got six work streams and three big projects. Agritech is slightly ahead. It went first. It's been given a two-year, $11 million budget to get some of those projects off the ground. Um, the tech story has got a $5 million budget to develop the tech industry, oh, not the tech story, the $5 million budget to develop the industry transformation plan. And then the things that are going into that plan then go into treasury and to government things. And the types of stuff we're looking at are things like changing the education system to create different types of digital apprenticeships um, to get it into a different pathway, changing the way they do the NCA standards, changing um, the, the structure for internships, or creating data and interoperability standards or open data. Um, in the government procurement side of things, um, uh, there'll be a, a move to agile procurement. So the, the level of change we can make together in these sorts of things is amazing. So the executive council with its members, and the more members you can get, the more credibility, the more change you can make, is looking forward to working together to start looking at those frameworks we've got, these opportunities, 
Um, how do we penetrate the Agritech digital interoperability standards work? Um, and, and what's the location view on that? How do we get location tech companies in there and people in there involved and making sure that, there's a, that that's included? How do we maybe think about as uh, in the, uh, the digital tech uh, um, ITP, the AI one is being run by our group, the AI Forum, which is one of your sister organisations now. The AI Forum is building the New Zealand national AI strategy at the moment. And so where's, where's the role in location information and where does it play with AI? I could go on, but basically uh, there are these opportunities that uh, as part of the tech alliance that you can like take a massive step forward as an organisation. To do that goes back to what Sam was saying. Um, you can leverage the credibility of the organisation you've joined, but there's nothing like having the credibility of a growing, vibrant community. And, and so creating that connect, those connect strategies, being much more strategic about the number of regular events, the topics of those events that lead towards those sort of plan changes you want to make, um, the content that you're developing out of those events to tell the world about things, the connections you're making into international standards bodies or other groups. Um, to give you an example, AI Forum has, uh, has had, had that as one of its focuses and has got people on the World Economic Forum um, uh, ethics creation group for the World Economic Forum for AI. It's got uh, people running two of the work streams for the partnership in AI, which is all the big global AI companies um, uh, alliance. So, so there's you know, learning from these other groups, you can really change the credibility and and the, and the opportunity, and then the, those positive spirals bring more people interested in being involved, and you get into this growing membership, which grows your resources, which grows your impact. So it's exciting. I mean, don't give me the mic, because I really love what I do, and I will talk to you all day about it. I'm pretty sure that you haven't heard, come here to hear about NZ Tech. NZ Tech is absolutely stoked that Location Tech is out there. It's formal. Um, we'll be working really hard with the team to try and encourage as many people to join as members. For those of you who are here who are not members, it's a honesty box system based on the size of your company. If you're a startup, it's 100 bucks. If you are a um, large multinational making gazillions of dollars, it's $25,000. Um, if you are a member of another NZ Tech Tech Alliance Association, it's just a tiny little increment on what you're already paying. Um, and, and then we split the money equally between the two associations. So if you hear from Microsoft, anyone here from Microsoft? Microsoft are a member of 10 of our associations. If they want to join an 11th one, we'll take your 35K and split it 11 ways, and it doesn't cost you a dime more. So, okay, you're not here? Well, we'll go talk to them later. So um, I can't stress how, enough of how important it is to uh, th get up and get involved, because this stuff doesn't happen I don't get paid. I'm a full-time employee. We've got 38 staff. We don't get this stuff done. We, we get funded by memberships. We raise $2.5 million a year on memberships. We spend that on rent, airplane fares, staff, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and, uh, if you want and, and each of these are siloed. So if you want Location Tech to be successful, it's not NZ Tech's members that are going to pay for you to get stuff done. It's Location Tech's members. So got it? Did I say that hard enough? join, get involved. And it's like a gym membership, as we say. Um, don't look back a year later and say, it was a waste of money. Don't, don't just pay, pay and play. All right, over to you. Uh, thanks for that, Graham. Um, we've got some, some really exciting speakers that, are gonna, that have come along tonight, and we're really grateful to have them come along. Um, Next up, I'd like to welcome Matt Leith from Linker Analytics, who's going to come share with us about how location technology influences AI and how, in turn, AI influences location technology. So I'm going to leave Matt to do that. Afternoon, everybody. Great to be here and great to see the energy uh, with the, uh, the, new, the new formation. Um, I've been part of my past of CBA. Um, now I'm with Linker and we're already AI first, so we drive AI outcomes. Uh, but we haven't forgot about location. And to me, the, the confluence of location technology with AI is a bit of a game changer. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a bit about today about what we're doing and show some examples of some of that economic sort of potential that's in front of all of us. So uh, this is a I guess at a junction in time where we've got a really fast-growing capability, AI, machine learning. 
uh, you know, all the, all the different paradigms of computing enabling cognitive function. This is probably, arguably, the fastest growing uh, innovation across the globe, right? It's, the, it's the, the current economic revolution. So here we are as a GIS, geospatial location industry, 40 years mature, really good at what we do. So how do we, how do we play together? What is, the, what is the solution? I see there's sort of three sort of macro trends that we need to think about. One is uh, there's a proliferation of data, of sensors that are sensing the planet. Whether that's our own smartphones in our pockets, whether that's more satellites, whether that's aircraft. Mark Rocket will talk shortly about a solar-powered drone flying New Zealand 24-7. So there's data, that, there's data, data, data. Uh, and now that data is sensing the earth, it's sensing the environment, it's sensing uh, every sort of condition and asset and, and habitat that, that's important to us. Uh, that's trend number one. Trend number two, computing. Cloud computing enablement is getting cheaper and cheaper, it's getting better and better, it's getting faster and faster. So that's great if you're into computing. What it means though is that there's this series of capabilities called deep learning, neural networks, which were actually invented in the 1950s in, in academia, that allow you to understand and model patterns and data to a, to a, to a very fine grain level, but it requires heavy compute. Now, those sorts of tools sort of lay in limbo. There was something called the AI winter, which was sort of 1950 to 2010, which, is, which was a period really where there just wasn't the ability to utilize these tools. Here we are in 2020. There's some real world applications now that can do things that we couldn't do before, that can do things faster and better than uh, we do them today, and that can really transform how we do business. So, to reiterate the comments of earlier from Sam and, and, and Graham, you need to work out how to play in that space. Uh, as a country, we need to, to work that out. Uh, what do we stand for and what are we, what are we really good at? Um, I've got some ideas and I, I wanna share some examples of, of that. Um, so yeah, the third tre trend really is these, these machine learning tools are globally just rocketing away and, and, and have the ability to transform. So there's a lot of stuff going on which is pointing to some real innovation that's, that's in front of, and it's great to see the government currently sort of having a digital, clear digital strategy that allows different agencies to work this stuff out and, and get some proof points. So I'm going to talk about three examples now over the next 10, 15 minutes. Three examples of where we might bring together location tech and AI. And these are problems that uh, have existed and been solved in different ways, very labor intensive that we've now solved far faster and far smarter, all these are new solutions, creating new value, from forestry to energy slash property through to retail. So first I'm gonna talk, talk about a project we've just completed for Ministry for the Environment. Uh, this is a, a forestry survey. As a country, we need to report our carbon contribution that underpins our commitment to, to the Paris Agreement and other agreements for the UN. Forestry is our single biggest sink of carbon in the country. So every two years, Ministry of Environment audit forest owners' behaviours around their forest activity. If harvest has occurred, have they replanted? Therefore, uh, are we continuing to sequest and store carbon uh, as a country? If not, we have to offset and pay on global markets the, the, the value commensurate with that offsetting. Now in the past, these are forest blocks, one hectare to 50 hectares, all over the place. To, to acquire that, to, to, to solve that problem, we've had people looking at photography, or firstly, looking at satellite imagery, aerial photography, out on the field, making judgments on uh, has a forest owner harvested? Have they converted to a different land use? Have they put it into pasture? Uh, have they re replanted? And, and that's quite a, quite a task, quite a process. It uh, costs sort of circa close to a million dollars uh, year on year to solve that problem. We put a proposal to the ministry that we would fly that uh, territory. It's about 90,000 hectares. Uh, and, and run a machine learning model against that data and automatically or semi-automatically classify the, the current usage of land there. Um, so this is the team here. This, we worked with a couple of companies, UAV Mapping and Carbon Forest Services, an aerial photography expert and a forestry manager. Um, this is a nice shot of Mount Cook, Aoraki, as the team crossed from west to east. Um, we flew at 5,000 feet, captured 25 centimetre imagery, high quality, um, created 30,000 photos were required, 
and we basically created a data set that we could pump into a machine learning method and process. So there's a lot of data engineering, a lot of sort of logistics involved there. I'm sure Mark shortly will talk about his solar powered aircraft being the next generation of that, which is great. This is an example of the footage here. So these are, you know, these are forest blocks. This is back country, right? There's no real information about what's going on here. Um, top left, you're seeing a, a block which was harvested three years ago, covered in scrub. Okay, so what's going on there? To the naked eye, is that vegetation? I can't really tell. Top right, you're seeing some fallen logs, some sort of harvest called cutover. So it's recently harvested. Bottom right, a very clean, clear site, harvested, and actually very, very small seedlings. And bottom left, you're seeing these sort of linear patterns of, I think there's a laser here, of rows here. These are a clear signal that pasture conversion is, you know, imminent. Okay, so this is the source. So we had this time seven and a half thousand, and some of the larger blocks required 30, 40, 50 photos. My colleague Sam over here in the audience spent many hours stitching together photos, rectifying, placing, and ensuring the data was ready for machine learning. No mean feat. And actually, as an industry, we're in a situation where the data needed to drive machine learning is where the cost and effort is. But if we can get that right, we can solve some pretty big, big problems. And that could be fisheries, that could be predator-free New Zealand, that could be a uh, condition of roads, that could be uh, uh, airway, e airline um, runway condition assessments, a whole manner of things through imagery recognition. So we use a little technique called active learning, which is really a human-in-the-loop computing approach, where we talk to a machine in human language, and we tell a machine, by example, what we're seeing. A machine will respond to that and give us and build a, a candidate algorithm. So, uh, Oops, I'll go back there. This is our machine learning model at the top here, this, this brain. This is our unlabeled data. These are all these new photos we've just flown. We build a weak model. We give, it, we give a model, let's say, 30 examples of each category. Okay? It might be mature forest. It might be seedlings. It might be bare ground. It might be conversion pasture. It might be uh, uh, mature, exotic forest. The model then proposes labels. It tells us what it thinks we've told it. But then something smart happens. The model also tells us about how confused it is. Okay? It's like our child saying, you know, we say the oven's hot. And of course they touch it when you tell them it's hot. You tell them again, but they've got to find out. Right? So we're telling a machine repeatedly what's going on. And, and, and it comes back and says, I can't quite distinguish. Is this seedling or is this mature forest? Give me, more, give me another example. So we go through, it through a process where we give it another example. We add those labels, we run it again, and we go around the loop. To explain that further, what we did in this case is we, 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 we shared a detailed view of a forest block. You might just be able to pick out small seedlings here and a larger view. So that's 10 by 10 metres, and that's 70 by 70 metres. Those two images times something like 2 million examples was fed to this machine. Okay. We then run a convolutional neural network, which is a type of, of neural network model, which could classify each and every 10 meter area in each and every forest block. How we did that was by presenting these sorts of examples. So, so my team spent you know, probably 200 person hours training a model to predict land cover inside forest blocks by telling it, those are seedlings, those are harvest tracks, that's exotic forest, that's pasture, those are buildings, that's cutover. Okay. That created a capability for us to automatically classify 7,500 locations. Now the results of that was, is this middle image here, which is a fairly speckled, fairly noisy sort of uh, appearance, but largely it's finding a predominant, in this case it's, it's a, what we call cutover, so it's a, it's a harvest site, but there are some elements of, is, is that vegetation, are they seedlings, is it scrub, what, what, what is it? So we applied some geospatial routines that we all know is an industry really well. These tools allow us to deal with some of the speckle and, and, and clutter. So these are well-established geospatial uh, approaches used to turn a, a machine learning result that a human has never looked at into a, a useful result. Another one here uh, where it's more complex, like a lot of native forest. Okay, This is a difficult site. Even for a human to make a judgment on the carbon implications of that block there is not easy. What we did is we broke it down to these 10, 10 by 10 meter pixels and we accounted for that. We measured each and every one into its land cover, 
classes, and we could provide that to the ministry for, for auditing. The little holes are interesting. Due to COVID, we were flying after winter because the aircraft was grounded, so we actually ended up choosing to not account for the, the deep shadows. A model cannot see inside the shadow, just like a human can't. Um, so in the future, we would, if we plan to fly through winter, we might, we might change that, we might adapt that to, to try and uh, you know, maybe change the altitude or change the, the angle, go to an oblique angle. The final result for this project was a series of, of, of land cover classifications and final statuses around carbon uh, offset and contribution for each, and each, each and every one of these locations. So here's a number of examples. I won't talk through all of them, but top, top left is a nice clean cutover site, one clean category, okay? But with some shadow at the top, some vegetation at the bottom, we had some GIS-based rules that allowed us to, to make a decision for that block, which was not replanted. Okay? So that forest owner has one more year to replant, or the hectare coverage, 6.6, .6, is reclassified as not forest anymore, so not under the, the carbon accounting trading scheme. Another example here, where it, is, where it has been replanted, and down here, it's, there's a conversion to pasture, and up in this top section, some native forests, some replanting as well. So as you can see, we're, we're able to look deeply into these locations far more than a human might look at a total picture and need to make a kind of a subjective decision, a qualitative decision. What AI gives us is the ability to get quite detailed measurement uh, at, at each and every block, at each and every 10 by 10 meter pixel across the country, allowing us to quantify close to 100,000 hectares of forest land. So that's allowed the ministry to really to have a, a, quite a detailed view of what's going on and have a sensible conversation with landowners around forestry. Second example. We are doing work with Harrison's Energy and homes.co.nz, who's a property uh, website, to model the, the value of solar potential to every New Zealand's roof. Now this is a GIS problem. There's an algorithm that determines the in received solar radiation based on a component or based on a, 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 a presentation of surface to the sky anywhere on the planet. And as, as this little video plays here, you'll see a, a view of the input receipt across uh, an area. So what we did here is we actually worked with open data sets from government. So one of the great things with New Zealand and our ability to be sort of, I think, at the forefront of this industry is LINS and other government agencies local authorities are really proactive at releasing and enabling key data like photography, like LIDAR, like building footprints to be available and to be put to work. So what we've done is we've done that. So left-hand side is the photography with building footprints on top, machine learned, okay, automatically defined building out outline. So roof position. The right-hand side is the solar surface from LIDAR. So that's the, the 3D profile of, the, of the, the surface of the earth. We turn that into a clipped version of solar input and receipt uh, for every, each and every rooftop. We then worked with Harrisons to uh, determine that against the potential economic value to a household for each and every roof. So in New Zealand, your typical energy bill is about $2,000 to $3,000, depending on your size of your property and your consumption and so forth. Uh, a good solar-facing roof in a good part of the country without a lot of shadow, a lot of, a lot of obstruction, might generate uh, three quarters of that. So the economics to the household are quite good. If you put a hybrid car in the mix, you might be you know, on the positive side of the ledger. So there's a lot of really interesting things here in terms of energy consumption, property decision making, asset value for, for homeowners to think about. So homes have the reach to a wider audience of homeowners and Harrisons are wanting to deliver their services and work with customers to, to enable them to get this advantage. So we go one step further, we then look at, at, let's go down to the roof level. So this is a, just an example, a little clip out of uh, part of Auckland, where we're starting to see, hopefully you can pick up sort of the micro detail. So we can see here, where should that solar panel array be? A three kilowatt array is 20 square meters. Okay, so we can work out where exactly, considering obstructions, shadow, the overall uh, um, geography of the place and sort of longer term shadows, for example, the hills up behind Wellington here, do cast a shadow even though those hills are three kilometers away. Okay, so we, we can understand those patterns. That's where the GIS comes in. That's where the geography is important. 
and we turn that into a where should the roof, uh, where should the panels be placed, and what value will they generate? So Harrisons can go confidently to a customer. A customer can confidently make a long-term investment. This data is free to consumers. The way the money flows is that when Harrisons uh, receive a lead, we get a small um, royalty. The customer can have a sensible conversation around the, the investment they're, ma they're making. So it's a great use of open data, great use of government expenditure to drive good decision making by, by residents. That all surfaces up in a, in a nice you know, environment where a customer can see, here's a couple of examples here, this property here, $912 a year. That's an average sort of property receipt. This one's a slightly better one down below here. Um, so we're trying to take that data right to the, to the consumer. And just I want to bring AI back into this mix here, because this is, while this is a really interesting scenario, and there's a bit of AI used throughout this, it's, th it's largely a location tech problem. This is, a, a, this is an example of what, what's happening behind the scenes with the, with the physics, with the, math, with the mathematics. There's a whole lot of calculations that go into the, the, the determination of solar receipt at a rooftop, including you know, the, the aspect, the shape, the, the orientation of the roof, where you are on the planet. Um, uh, uh, the, the atmospheric conditions, you know, in some cities there's more smog, there's more transmissivity, all those things go into that equation. A four kilometre by four kilometre tile, this area here, takes 40,000 seconds for us to run on a pretty high grade server, running that physics calculation, because we need to calculate the input every three days and then aggregate that to a total year. So we said, oh, let's try and see if we can machine learn that. What's the, what's the potential of doing that faster? and therefore doing all of New Zealand faster, right? And updating it faster, getting the data out to, to, to residents faster. Well, it's 40,000 times faster. Okay, so we can machine learn that, we can train by example, we can tell our machine learning model, an algorithm, that this right-hand side, which is the solar receipt surface, that's the solar value surface. I'm gonna go back. What does that look like based on the physics, based on the science? We're within 5%. So we're within 5% of the actual calculated answer, taking into account a lot of different variables and metrics. Now with more training, no reason why we shouldn't be able to do that for every location in the country. And similar things. Okay, if there's similar problems that we've got that are very labor intensive or compute intensive using geospatial technology, let's consider how we could migrate those to an AI-based approach. I'll leave that with you. One more example, retail. We've been starting to play in the retail space looking at the predictability of consumer behavior using AI. Uh, so a lot of things go into consumer behavior about intent, about purchasing, about uh, uh, you know, patterns of spend. There's a very mature set of uh, activities in the analytics field around this. That Some are location-oriented, some are not. The BI field is a big part of what are consumers buying, when, where, how often, how frequent, what are they going to buy next? You'll all be familiar with the recommendation systems that Netflix and Amazon and others are using, which is predicting your behavior through your very fine-grained clicking activity and watching activity. These sorts of capabilities are also possible in the location arena and also in the AI arena. So we're working with a partner, in NCB Consulting, who do work with some of New Zealand's largest retailers, looking at the kind of the business case of good analytics for a retailer. So there's a whole lot of established geo, geospatial, geographic type uh, analytics that's going on. Here's an example here of sort of drive time boundaries. So these are store locations, 13, 9, 11, 12. This is the drive time, 10 minutes that a consumer should be considering using this store for this service. Up on the right here, we have customer locations, we have stores, we have competitors. Okay, good stuff. That's kind of how analytics is run for retail. There's some great tools, and this is a Power BI uh, ESRI uh, version of, of, of sort of hexagon-based heat mapping, the darker colors being nodes of high-value customers. There's a notion in retail recency, frequency, monetary. How recently, how much value, uh, and how often is that consumer buying in my store? Okay, so we can map that stuff. It's very geographic, highly geographic. And then if you break it down to a store, and a lot of store owners and branch managers will manage their point of sale data. They'll look at you know, value of business spend, number of customers, a 
across all my stores and start to work out what should I promote to whom, when, to what value. Should I separate? You know, Briscoe's is a good example in New Zealand. They tend to have the same offering for every store, regardless of demographics. It goes against the grain of all GIS thinking. Some retailers don't. Catman do stock different products in Queenstown to Wellington to Auckland. Okay, depends on your approach to, 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 to retail, to business. My view is that the analytics, the data should drive that, that decision, that mindset. Drive time polygons. And the one on the right is very interesting as I, co as I come to kind of what we've started to look at with AI. The right hand side is, is, is a view of one particular retailer purchasing by channel. So who buys online, who doesn't? Who comes into the store? Okay, and how does that relate to the demographics? Dark blue being online purchasing through to lighter blues for, this is an Auckland based retailer. Okay, it's all good stuff, working well. Arguably stores are, are performing you know, at their optimum, perhaps. So we said, well, let's look at a, a decision tree based machine learning approach where we look at all the inference of geographic data with store data, with information about say property. So this is an example of a utility who we're working with. Uh, we're using a random forest model, which is a de decision tree based machine learning model, which looks at uh, information about type of product this customer is on. For example, is it electricity or gas or broadband? Uh, where do they live? How big is the property? How big is the section? What's the, what do we know from the census about all those parameters? You know, census has 650 various attributes through the, the four yearly survey, but also other surveys throughout. Pretty rich in data, so a lot of inference value. So we've got three different sort of geographic data inputs there. And within the customer CRM, you've got, are they late payers? Are they good payers? Have they changed plans? So there's a whole lot of knowledge there, right? So with these sorts of models, we can actually train a model to understand the feature importance, the, the, the relative inputs and the values of geographic data, non-geographic data, all together, and come up, come up with some decisions. So what we did here, is we produced a prediction model for them where we predicted at a household level, at a property level, the likelihood of a customer responding to a particular offer for a particular product for a particular price, just like Netflix do, all AI driven. So firstly, top left is, is, is an aggregation of predictability of likely to respond, one bright, so gold for dark blue being absolutely one, this, most customers in this geography will respond to that offer. And how do we know that? Because we've done inference based on all the patterns of spend over many years in the CRM, in the customer's data sets, but also in the, in the geographic data sets that we've inferred across census, property information. And there's many more. Um, and so what we do, so that's the first step. We get this view of kind of the, the areas that perhaps we should focus. So we should put Perhaps billboards, well, we might want to put them in the south, Hillsborough, this sort of area, or out west. Probably not up here, doesn't seem. But we then drive right down into the property level. So if we've got the geographic data and we've got the smarts, we can actually predict large disk being highly predictive. You know, they're going to watch that next movie that I'm going to recommend to these guys. They're not interested. So don't bother broadcasting your offer on TV NZ to that same cohort of people, because you don't know who's watching, right? Why not go through a very targeted mode to that audience? So location is all over that problem, right? So that's an area that we sh we're only just starting. New Zealand's pretty limited in its sophistication of retail compared to other countries. You know, other countries are looking at all sorts of enablement of tech through, you know, shopping basket recommendations, through in-store, you know, purchasing, through all sorts of uh, association of where products should be, in which stores, in which aisles, in which shelf. Geography is everywhere in that problem. So we think this is a really interesting space to be in. I think this is a real big confluence of all the tech that we're working on, uh, and it creates the ability for us to really deliver useful things to customers, permission-based. Right? We don't want to get broadcast with stuff we don't want to see, but if we like the products, we're probably going to be okay with getting an offer for the product that we know we've expressed interest in. I'm going to say thank you. I'm not sure if there's time for questions, Sam, but if there is, happy to take them.
Darren. He doesn't need a mic. I'm an I. Yeah, okay. Um, Darren from Locus. Uh, have you done any actual uh, evaluation on the solar panels? So, you know, this is the expected uh, value of those solar panels if they were installed uh, and what it is actually now. So, um, you've done that after the fact. Have you done that? Yeah, thanks, Darren. We have. Yeah, the. the uh, initial work at determining that economic value, the value per year to the customer, was yeah. calibrated to about four, uh, several hundred um, Harrison's installs. So the model, the physics told us a certain level in yeah. terms of kilowatt hours to calibrate that to dollars because retail pricing changes geographically. Yeah. We worked with them to, to land that at a number which was relevant and pro probably a little bit conservative yeah. to actual. That's cool. Right, I've got another question for you then. Yeah. Uh, quite like this, um, the LiDAR stuff. Obviously, that's a big bear bug when it comes to uh, massive data sets. Um, so when it's 40,000 times faster, is that leveraging the AI or is that leveraging AI? So is it like for like? Are you using a computer with the same type of power? Um, so how is that all powered? The artificial intelligence, the, the, the software behind it, you know? Um, does that make sense? It does, yeah. So it's a deep learning model. It's a particular type of deep learning model that actually runs on a GPU, which is different to a CPU. So it's a specialist piece of hardware. Um, but regardless, I think if you put the, the GIS process on a GPU, uh, it would be, it tends to be, GIS tends to be more RAM memory hungry. Uh, it would be um, of that order. You know, we might, we might be talking a few percent better if you took the same compute. Yeah. But conceptually, it's a massive difference. It's such a large difference that uh, it shows the scalability is clearly in the AI space, not the, not the geospatial space. Okay, cool. uh, yeah, okay, sorry. You got another one. Uh, I thought the shops one, mate, that was awesome, right? Um, I think to summarize that one, um, I think you covered that off. Um, so you're basically doing the predictability. Um, so that information is derived from their CRM information, all the, all the products and stuff that they sell. Is that right? That was one input. Yeah, the, yeah. Predict, the prediction was the likelihood of responding to an offer, particular right. offer. Yeah, okay. So um, I think the other thing is, how cool would it be to go and uh, acquire a whole load of data sets of different products around the world and use the AI to tell you what products you should sell and to what location, and that's your business. Yeah, <laughs> I might have to talk after this. Why not? Yeah, great yeah, thought. Man, that was a great presentation. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Darren. It's not specifically about your presentation, Matt, but I guess um, as we're location tech, and this is our launch event, um, coming from the AI side, what is one thing that you would like to see location tech look at addressing that would, that would be beneficial in the AI space? I think really understanding the power of geographic data in a different way. So, what are some of the, what are the, I mean, the, the location industry, the tech industry has been great at working with governments, utilities, uh, you know, defense force, uh, forestry, asset owners. We, we understand land, we understand water, we understand environment, we understand you know, conservation. We, we haven't really, we as the location industry, I don't think have tapped into some of these other, but insurance or retail or banking, yeah. uh, some of the markets where Geography is everywhere in those, in those markets and not understood. So maybe it's a combination of working with the AO Forum, our group, Location Tech, IoT, Ag Tech, to see if we can explain and share some of those stories that Graham mentioned earlier with that cohort of customers. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, uh, perhaps another way of looking at it is do you, like the location technology industry has been very good at doing things with technology that you could actually see from the air when you can't see it from the air, when it's intangible like that, especially what you're doing to responding to retail, that's when it becomes difficult to conceptualize and difficult to articulate, but you've got tooling that can help us unravel that story better. I agree totally. The, the, you've really got to understand implicitly, you don't have to see it with your eyes to believe it. We need to train it, we need to train the thought process, our cognitive function about what we're seeing and what we think should happen into a model. So if we control the models, the models will, you know, help us achieve and solve problems faster. If we sort of sit back and think, oh, I don't really quite understand this space, I'm not gonna use it, or I'm not gonna trust it, well, I think we're in trouble then. So we shouldn't be shy from this space, we should walk into it and, and, and work with it. 
Well, thank you very much for your, your presentation. Oh, wait, we've got Graham. Keep, keep it easy. <laughs> no, just, just a uh, quick one. Um, Tower Insurance just joined um, InsureTech, and uh, in discussions with the CEO of Tower Insurance, he's just come over from the UK where he was a chief digital officer for um, Avida, which is a big insurance company, and they were doing exactly this, to your point, is that um, they were using location data and, um, and behavior data through modeling of things like shopping and uh, traffic and all this kind of stuff to assess how to be more accurate on their insurance modeling. Um, so you, you start to think about less about, you know, it's very easy to think about what GIS has been used for before, like how do we work out where to put the building or et cetera, et cetera. But it's actually, um, it's about humans and human behaviors and things like that. And everything you look at, it always it comes back to where is that activity happening in a time and space perspective and then what's different from where it was last time. So it kind of sits, we were talking about this before and until I heard this presentation, I was going, nah, location's not, not as important as AI, but it's, it's, uh, it's it, yeah, now, I, now I'm getting it that it's like interwoven because it's an, it's an, it's an element of that data which feeds everything. Yeah, do you, do you, no, no, no one here would disagree. Geographic data has the most connectedness inference value of all data types. So we can join together data through its geography. And that tells us something about the environment, about the behavior. So that's a critical input. Yeah, so it's a good time to be in the location tech space for sure. Cool. I was gonna say there is a somewhat slightly scarier element. And I think that is the ability for AI in the way that it operates to influence our behaviors. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, that that could completely change our buying habits, that could com change how we um, communicate with people. Um, that's, kind of that's kind of a little bit worrying as well, right? You know, so um, all that data that's captured from our phones and Google, um, you kind of, you, 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 I'm just curious what types of things are in the industry uh, to protect us from, look, everything can be used for good and bad. It's that simple, right? So what types of things are the industry as it matures uh, put in place to make sure that you don't do things that you're not supposed to be doing or uh, you try and uh, bend the will of people without them realizing, you know? That's a Facebook 101, I suppose. Yeah, to topic for another conference, but certainly uh, I think Graham mentioned New Zealand AI Forum are on a number of kind of global boards of ethics and what's appropriate for AI. But we are all being influenced today, whether we like it or not. I guess we've got to keep control. And as a country, we've got to be smart. We've got to understand how to use this technology and not, you know, let it use us. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much, man. I'm just going to give everybody here and in Christchurch and online just a quick 30 seconds that it'll all be to just to shake out the wiggles and talk to your neighbour. Um, and, well, I'm not sure if we can top up drinks. Sorry, we've got to keep things rolling, but yeah. I had a lecturer at uni who used to do this. Just stopping for 30 seconds is enough to make everybody feel a lot better. <laughs> All right, everyone, I promised you it would be 30 seconds and that's all it's going to be because we need to keep motoring on. So I would ask you all to return to your seats. Right, so the, I was really fortunate earlier this week to meet with Mark Rocket, 
Um, Mark is a co-founder of Rocket Lab, who, who, who no longer works with Rocket Lab per se, but has been doing some really interesting things in Christchurch with his new company, Kia Aerospace. Now, I think what's really fascinating, I, 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 he's not able to attend with us tonight, so um, he, he and I videoed a, a, an interview. It goes for about 20 minutes together. Um, and I guess one of the things that I want you guys to, to sort of think about is looking at Matt's presentation and, and that comment he made about location data being one of those uh, rich inputs and in one of those common languages around how we can make inference and, and think about some of the practical benefits of, of what Mark and his team are working on. So, uh, Bree, if we could kick that off, that would be fantastic. Um, I guess, firstly, Mark, thanks for, for joining us today to um, tell us a little bit about Kia Aerospace and the exciting innovations that you, uh, you're you working on. Um, I'm really excited about sharing with our member community the sorts of things that you're looking at um, and perhaps exploring some of the details around what they might be able to look forward to in terms of application in both the wider New Zealand innovation sphere and, and perhaps in their own jobs personally in a few years' time. So, um, yeah, maybe tell us a bit of, about Kia Aerospace and, and yourself. Yeah, well, Kia Aerospace started off around two years ago, mm -hmm. and two main goals. One is to find a really exciting commercial project that we could get underway here in Canterbury. Yep. And secondly, to help build an aerospace ecosystem in Canterbury. It really bugged me that a lot of fantastic graduates didn't really have any jobs to go to here and they ended up going to work at Rocket Lab or other places around the world or around the country uh, and really Canterbury Christchurch doesn't have too much aerospace activity going on as much as it could. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah basically the aerospace ecosystem work has been going really well. We've, we've started out Aerospace Christchurch and run really great meetups uh, so if people are in Christchurch check out www.christchurch.space or even if you just want to visit for an event, we run events every six or eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And as part of that work, we instigated the Aerospace X Sector Plan for Christchurch, the first city in New Zealand to actually have a space strategy. Yeah, cool. Uh, and we've got a committee of industry participants, uh, and that, that's really exciting. But I guess what we're talking about today is is the commercial project. Yeah. And uh, been looking around for a long time. And I guess initially I was sort of looking for payload uh, applications. We've got this fantastic capability with Rocket Lab being able to launch uh, payloads into space uh, and I thought you know what can we do with that capability mm. uh, and looking around at, at, at different uh, ways of um, of utilizing that but along that journey came across this idea of working in the stratosphere yeah and uh, yeah basically we've, we've just recently launched Kia Aerospace building this vehicle that flies in the stratosphere solar powered uh, can fly for months at a time uh, and it's just a, a beautiful technology that um, has a lot of pluses. You know, you're 20 times closer to the Earth than uh, space-borne technology, mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, a lot easier, a lot, lot more cost-effective to get to the stratosphere in a solar-powered vehicle compared to all the costs of developing a rocket, payload, and uh, operating, launching into space. Yeah. So I guess I just want to pause there for a sec, I, um, just to, to, to sort of condense and summarise what what I really want everybody um, out there to, to recognise is you just said that in Christchurch, you guys have been prototyping a solar-powered unmanned vehicle that's going to fly in the stratosphere. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Now, I think that's pretty exciting, even just from a, a vehicle geekery perspective. But um, I guess <clears throat> we'll get into it later. I think there's, there's so many applications that of, of what you can do with that vehicle to provide value to New Zealand um, as well. So we'll get there a little bit later around more of the data intelligence stuff that, that you guys are looking at. But perhaps um, tell us a little bit about your vehicle. Now I understand it's called Kia Atmos. Is That's that correct? Correct. Yeah. Yep. Um, how long have you been working on it for? Yeah, really the last year uh, has been the, the most time that we've been working on it. And I, I guess we've started off on smaller vehicles, um, testing uh, wingspan vehicles of, of a couple of meters through to eight meters yeah. wingspan. So um, what was the what was the first prototype you you did? What size was that? Yeah, just just a couple of meters. Um, mm -hmm. So it's so really just playing around with uh, autonomous flight and, and other kind of systems. Uh, and we also moved into testing in the stratosphere with balloons. Mm -hmm. uh, so to test the technology up in, in that extreme environment uh, yeah. is quite useful. So yeah, next year we've got a whole bunch of balloon flights planned to, to test the hardware up in high altitude. Um, but meanwhile, we're also uh, building uh, vehicles to go for longer duration. So one of the milestones that we have for the first quarter 
of next year, while the summer is still there, we've got lots of solar hours to tap into, uh, is to break the world record for endurance flight for a UAV uh, weighing under 25 kg. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want to be going over 80 hours, constant flight, continuous flight uh, to, to break that world record. Yeah. And I guess it's worth explaining to people who might not be aware, like what's the significance of the stratosphere um, with this particular vehicle. So um, from what I, I understand is, is a, a key differentiator is it's higher than the, the commercial flight, um, but lower than what satellites um, are able to achieve. So you're actually, um, it sounds like you're working in an untapped area or reasonably untapped area um, and, and looking to commercialize in that, in that particular space. Yeah, so uh, the, the sort of typical commercial passenger flight you take might be 10, 12 kilometers altitude. Uh, so we're up at 20 kilometers altitude. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, in, in the sort of sweet spot where you're above the weather uh, and above the jet streams and above the, the, the airspace. So you might see the odd U-2 rocket or mm -hmm. plane, sorry, yeah. U-2 plane that's flying around, um, but uh, not so much in the Southern Hemisphere, of course. But uh, yeah, there's nothing else really up there except uh, a few weather balloons. Uh, so it's a really underutilized airspace. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, you don't have uh, as much issue with the regulatory aspect. You know, you're not gonna be disrupting commercial flights, that, yeah. that, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it, because you are above the weather uh, and it is relatively benign, uh, without uh, some of those uh, harsh winds, etc., you know, you, you can you can fly co continuously. Um, so yeah, there's some some big pluses there. I guess you, a lot of the, your people would know that uh, a lot of the aerial imagery that's actually useful for scientific and business purposes at the high resolution actually comes from manned aircraft, mm. and so that might be flying at you know one or two kilometres altitude. I mean, there's all sorts of different options there, but. Yes, generally it's a low altitude craft, but they're very limited by the coverage yes. and it's, it's very expensive. It's very expensive and to the point where um, many out there may not know this, but typically the aerial imagery that, that we would see through a local government website would be procured by that government organisation per se and they might have a, a procurement cycle that covers their whole region at different resolutions over the span of four or five years. So that's, that's not up to date. There's not a lot... Um, I mean, it's useful from a from a historic perspective to see how things are changing, but it's not as if you're going to be able to start doing any meaningful intelligence in real time unless you're capturing that information as it's you, unless you're starting to use that information as soon as it becomes available, and then it becomes stale quite quickly, doesn't it? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So um, before we dig in too far into that aerial imagery part, which is I think where um, perhaps the the location tech members will be. Um, sort of most familiar. Um, can you tell us about some of the challenges you guys have faced so far in your prototyping, if that's not you know sensitive information? Uh, yeah, well, I, I guess uh, sort of regulatory stuff. Um, you know, we're having to work with CAA to uh, get approval to do certain types of, of testing. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the kind of main hurdle that we see you know coming up for us. Um, but luckily, we've been accepted into the airspace integration trials. We're the first New Zealand-owned company, um, second company after WISC. Mm -hmm. to be accepted into that uh, trial program for special aircraft testing. Yeah. So we're hoping that will accelerate uh, some of the regulatory aspects that we need to be working through over the next few years. Yeah. Uh, obviously we are you know, taking off into a whole new realm up there mm. and um, you know, we've got to work out how to get through the commercial airspace uh, up into uh, the stratosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, really excited to be working with MB uh, on that and, and be accepted into that program. Yeah. Um, but yeah, certainly there's some massive uh, challenges and I guess a lot of it is about power management. You know, how can you actually keep this vehicle flying continuously uh, just on solar solar, pa solar pa power? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it could be the power of about three hair dryers that we've got to keep this thing uh, continually, continuously running on. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, you've got to keep the, the motors and, uh, and, and all the systems on board. Well, and I don't think you've actually um, mentioned during this interview View, but I know that in other conversations you've said the actual vehicle itself could be the type, the size of about three three buses end to end. The wingspan, yeah. The so wingspan. About, about 32 metres, yeah. yeah. So it'll be the largest uh, unmanned vehicle built in the Southern Hemisphere. And yeah. So so getting that, that power optimization and, and, and optimising the solar, you know, consumption for that's going to be, yeah, a pretty, uh, pretty tricky problem to solve, I'm guessing. Yeah. So we need a lot of solar panels. Um, yeah. That's, that's, you know, having a large wingspan, you know, helps with that. But yeah. Um, yeah so I guess that that's a, a key thing that we're going to be focusing on mm -hmm. uh, and just the technology of being able to operate it. Uh, yeah. autonomously and uh, yeah, getting all the systems working as, as they should. 
Yeah. So um, you you talked earlier about looking for a, a payload type solution um, as part of the, the commercial aspect of Kia Aerospace. Um, and we've touched a little bit on aerial imagery, but what other challenges do you hope that Kia Atmos will be able to solve? Yeah, well, aerial imagery is the, the key focus area for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we think there's uh, so many data gaps at the moment from precision agriculture, forestry management, maritime surveillance, smart cities, uh, many different areas that uh, do need a help and with. So, you know, we want to basically be taking that data, putting it into our data cube and allowing people to be able to just jump in and, and get access to the information that they need to, but, you know, also chucking layers in there so that these meaningful insights that people can, can log in and get directly mm. uh, on a subscription-based uh, model. Uh, so you certainly, yeah, aerial imagery is a key focus point, point for us, but uh, also, also there's going to be a lot of payload testing type uh, things that are going to be required. So we've been contacted by some people with really interesting payloads. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that'll be certainly uh, something that, that we look at. Yeah, um, and I guess that's not something I'd really thought of before. If somebody else is looking to develop a, a product or or something that they need to take up into the stratosphere to understand the impacts of that on that 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 product, you can take it there for them. Yeah, and it, it can, can be a, a step to um, you know hardening for space. You know, you, you could be putting a payload up there that you may one day want to put up into a a, a space born. Mm -hmm. um, application so yes certainly that there's that side of things there's also communication so a lot of these high altitude platforms haps as they're called um, a lot of these vehicles have been used for communications uh, around the world or mm -hmm. there are test programs underway but no one's really operating commercially yeah. at the moment so yes yeah, certainly aerial imagery communications payload testing would be some of the key areas yeah interesting and i guess yeah you, you started talking about aerial imagery and the other side of of what you're doing here at Kia aerospace, you've got Kia Atmos as the vehicle, and the other side is around data intelligence. And that's, um, like you said before, capturing that aerial imagery, um, but also uh, storing it and transforming it in a way that people can get immediate insights straight away. Um, so yeah, I guess <laughs> that, that, from my perspective, not knowing terribly uh, much about, about the technicals of of um, unmanned flight, <laughs> you've you've got a vehicle that's going to be up in space for, for oh, sorry not space up into the into the stratosphere for how long? Well, it could be flying for months at a time. Months at a time, and that's potentially continuously capturing aerial imagery or photos every, uh, you know, every there'd be increments as to how often it's taking taking images. Yeah, uh, probably work, work so well at night time, but yeah. um, during, during the daytime uh, and uh, yeah, clouds could be an issue, but you know, mm -hmm. it depends on what sort of payload that we've got on board, yeah. what sort of camera. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess a lot of the time we'll be looking for clear days um, for a lot, a lot of that kind of high resolution imagery that people want. Yeah, and um, I guess my experience working with aerial photos is that it's typically really uh, large files. Are you going to be you know, do we have to wait for the vehicle to touch down and land before you can, you know, take off a, a giant uh, storage device off and, and plug it into something to upload it back into the cloud? Uh, pun, pun unintended. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, or, or are you? Is this going to be coming back to some some storage facility somewhere as as, it, as it's flying? Correct. Yeah, we'll have a ground segment so that we'll be able to beam back the information mm -hmm. and uh, and pop that into into our servers and and process it. Yeah. Awesome. So you touched on a, a few of the, the high level areas where you think um, having more, having higher precision and more frequent aerial imagery updates could really add value. You talked around precision agriculture and smart cities and a few other spaces. Um, are there perhaps maybe like two or three really exciting things that you, you would like to see these information products used for? Yeah, well, I think uh, water management is around New Zealand is something that bugs a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it'd be really exciting if we actually had a real clear picture of our waterways and, and uh, what's going into our waterways and you know how we can better manage our waterways. I think a lot of Kiwis would be pretty excited about being able to do uh, more around that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it could be around fertilizer use. You know, we, we are, are we overusing fertilizers? Where can we you know cut back on that? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think certainly the ground management, water management kind of stuff is, is going to be pretty exciting for a farming-based uh, country. Yeah, and, and ultimately, 
um, enable some of our, our core industries to be more stable, more en environmentally friendly, which is, I think, a, a direction that all of us want to be to be going, in, uh, mm. farmers included. You know, it's really yeah. important to mm. to make sure that that the way we're using our land and, and our, our primary industries are built on a, st a stable background. So this is a, a tool to now enable people to optimize the way they're operating. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, also maritime surveillance is a really interesting one as well. I mean. Our uh, exclusive economic zone is about 15 times the size of the landmass of New mm -hmm. Zealand, uh, so we've got a lot of illegal fishing going on and, and other kind of kind of activities. So you know, been been able to get a handle on that. I think we've only got a couple of frigates in, in the New Zealand Navy at the moment, yeah. so it'd be uh, good to supplement that mm -hmm. uh, and, and been able to, to really keep a track on what's going on. Yeah. Um, yeah, and perhaps is there is there one more? I mean, I, I guess I'm a little bit intrigued when you say smart cities because it's such mm -hmm. a, a wide. Um, a wide concept. Where, where are some, what some of the aspects of smart cities do you think that enhanced imagery will be able to help? Yeah, yeah. So I, we want to be operating in New Zealand first of all, but mm. uh, after that, looking to move into Australia and uh, in the Pacific and other areas where there's a favourable regulatory environment for us to move into. But you know, let's say you know moving into Asia, uh, imagine a, 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 one of these vehicles over Singapore, mm -hmm. and uh, basically just continually uh, doing a grid pattern around Singapore to give a, a really smart, uh, complete smart cities update on what's going on. So monitoring infrastructure projects, uh, roading projects, looking at potholes, looking at green spaces, uh, looking at uh, what's going on in the port, you know, what ships are coming in, what, what are going out. Mm -hmm. You just basically have the complete data picture of a city. Mm. And, and you know, that could be the same for Sydney or uh, Melbourne, uh, Auckland, whatever, and basically just having a complete picture uh, of what's going on. Um, you touched on before that you're going to start off in New Zealand um, and then uh, assuming that you've got some, uh, you know, a, a conducive regulatory environment to move into, you'd look to move offshore. But I wanted to, to we're location tech and, and our, our purpose is to empower um, location tech innovations in New Zealand. And I think this really falls into something we want to get behind and support. But my question is, why have you chosen to do this in New Zealand? What are the benefits? Yeah, good, good question. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think, you know, similar to the journey that we had with Rocket Lab, uh, there are a lot of favourable aspects to, to developing technology companies here. Uh, so I think just being able to pick up the phone and talk to the people that you need to. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah, that makes it a lot easier. Obviously, we've got comparatively open skies and variable terrain uh, to do a lot of that stuff. And, and also, we've got a lot of talented people. Um, it's just a bit of a can-do kind of place to get stuff done. Uh, I remember, you know, when we started Rocket Lab, people didn't really believe that New Zealand uh, could actually have a rocket company. Yeah. <laughs> Thirteen years ago, you know, uh, people thought we were a little bit nuts giving, yeah. it, giving it a go. You know, that, that's the kind uh, of stuff. I don't know if was... people have finished, you know, thinking <laughs> that you're nuts or not, Mark. But it's all good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I think you know, early on, people didn't, you know, totally see the vision. They thought it was a cool thing, but didn't really think it could be a reality. Yeah. Uh, but as it worked out, you know, New Zealand is, a, is actually a great place to start a company like Rocket Lab. Mm. And uh, you know Australia, they've been trying to do the same thing for many years, it never got off the ground, so to speak. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of other countries that just cost a lot more mm. to get stuff done mm. uh, for whatever reason. So I think you know you can do things uh, cost effectively here, and you know maybe a little bit less red tape. Yeah. Uh, and it's just you know people are really fascinated by technology. We actually have all sorts of different niches in New Zealand that uh, we're pretty pretty effective at. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if it's mindset. Um, I guess you know the biggest problem for a, a lot of companies is the money side of it. You know, there's a lot of money in America, Asia, yeah. those sort of places, um, and uh, they're a little bit more entrepreneurial uh, in some ways as far as you know being prepared to, to back new ideas. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's probably one of the biggest holdups. But you know that's changing now. You know, New Zealand's getting a brand uh, of, of successful companies, and, yeah. and inv international investors are looking to, to come here. Yeah, yeah. And, and Rocket Lab's going to be found, like one of the foundational companies that's sort of you know, pumping up that brand for us, hasn't mm, it? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. No, so it's a good successes. You know, saying that, you know, I'm very care, keen for Kia Aerospace to be New Zealand owned. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't want to um, be bought out by, you know, big international companies. Yeah. I, I want to be based here and uh, and long term, you know, have a, have a presence internationally or uh, operating from New Zealand. So that, that would be a really exciting vision that I'd like to see happen. Yeah, absolutely. No, that, that sounds fantastic. It's really exciting. But I guess on the flip side, you, you did sort of touch on it a little bit, but what are the, what are the, what are some of the challenges um, that, that um, being New Zealand-based presents? So you talked a little bit about offshore investment. 
being something you know there, there might be a bit deeper money um a, a maybe money that's more prepared to be to back something that 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 could be perceived as a little bit more experimental um what what are some of the other challenges of, of operating out of out of little old new zealand well very few at the moment with the covid thing yeah, going yeah. On the world. <laughs> um, so obviously a lot of countries are doing doing it pretty tough at the moment so mm -hmm. i think we kind of underestimate how lucky we are actually here i talk to people internationally all the time and it sounds you know, pretty pretty horrible what, what a lot of people are having to go through mm -hmm. um but yeah i guess uh, next year you know with the vaccine coming out you know uh, it'd be great for the world to, to open up more and uh, and that'll all change but uh i think the the uh challenges can be to do with the market you know mm. we've got a very small market size yeah. here in new zealand it's quite um, shallow too yeah, yeah. Uh, so there, there are all sorts of markets that make sense to, to go to America or, or go to different places around the world to tap into. So I think it really depends on you know, what your, your aims are, who your mm -hmm. target market is. Um, for us, you know, luckily, uh, we've actually got a, a pretty uh, good market to tap into here in New Zealand, Australia uh, and, and other nearby countries. Uh, and then we can spread that out uh, yeah. quite nicely and start uh, working with other countries. Yeah, awesome. Um, I guess in terms of next steps, um, one of the things I'd like to know a little bit about is like, where do you go next? When do you, where do you hope? When do you hope that this something like this, if successful, would be commercially available? Yeah, so our plan is to have that rec world record attempt next year. So mm -hmm. that'll be really exciting for us to test uh, some of our technology, uh, and then after that, we'll be looking at starting to build the first full scale thirty two meter wingspan vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, we'll be doing additional uh, flight testing as well of, of other vehicles next year with an aim um, to first test fly our full-scale Kiratmos uh, in 2022 mm -hmm. and start some uh, early customer trials. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, hopefully in a year or two we'll, we'll have something large flying around. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's going to be pretty exciting. That's cool. Um, so how do we keep up to date with what you're doing and how it's progressing? Yeah, so we've got our mailing list uh, on our website, so check out kiaerospace.com mm -hmm. uh, and you can keep up to date if you sign up to our, our newsletter. Also, uh, Christchurch Aerospace, if you go to, uh, well actually Aerospace Christchurch, if you go to Christchurch.space, uh, you can um, hear about their events and what's going on. Mm. But I think we've got some really tremendous activity happening here locally. Yeah. Uh, and looking forward to seeing what's going to be happening in the next year or two. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, Mark. Um, it's It's been wonderful to have you here and, and sharing about uh, the innovations that you guys are, are creating. I'm really excited to see how, how it progresses. And I think it's fantastic that um, we're able to share this as part of a launch event for Location Tech. So thank you very much. Thanks, Sam. Yes. <laughs> cool. Now, I would ask if anyone has any questions, but I'm the least qualified person in the room to ask so anything about that. <laughs> but yeah, no, thank you everyone for attending tonight. Please help yourself to food and beverages. Stay around and have a bit of a chat. We'd love to talk a little bit more about what interests you, what excites you. If you want to get involved, we'd, we'd love to chat. Is there anything you want to say, Graham? No. Awesome. Thanks for staying.